All right, so I have the easy job now of asking them questions. So Dr. Cooper, can you please start us off? Tell us about the efforts that you've led to treat violence as a health issue. Tell us about how you can encourage also other hospitals to engage in violence interruption. Dr. Wen, thank you for the question and, and the opportunity. You know, it was in the early 1970s that uh, Everett, Everett, C. Everett Coop first said that violence is a public health crisis. Unfortunately, it's taken us as healthcare providers a little while to really lock on to it, to our role in this process. It's only been in the past two decades that hospitals and healthcare systems have seen when we can be a part of the prevention intervention process. But why should, why should we be a part of that process? Well, if you look at our nation's trauma centers across the country, 30 to 60% of all our patients who admitted to our hospitals because of violent injuries will return to that hospital with a similar kind of injury, another violent injury. And if when they come back, their chances of dying is much higher. In some studies, as high as 10, as 10 times, 10 fold higher. So, so when we see our patients who are victims of violence, we have an opportunity, and some may even say an obligation, to see what we can intervene to keep them from coming back to our hospitals. So as a trauma surgeon, I, going through training, I saw the, these victims of violence come into our, to our hospital. And we often ask questions, what, and we, and we do a great job. As hospitals, we do a great job of saving the lives of these victims of, of violence. We've had, we, inter, we have, over the past decades, brought in new things that really impact the lives that we're saved. But they are coming back to us. So we asked the question, what could we do, do differently? In our first study, we asked, we asked the question, what are the factors that put our young men and women at risk of being victims of violence? And these are things that you all could rattle off very quickly. They are having a lack of education, substance abuse, being from dysfunctional families, poor neighbors, et cetera. So we then took that information and we developed a hospital-based violence intervention program. Intervention program. We instituted, a, did a randomized prospective study geared to us, asked the question, what could we do different? Half our patients got the program, half did not. And what we were able to show that was, was that, that, that 36, 40% of patients, we were, sorry, we were able to decrease civism by as high as 40%, showing that we as a hospital could intervene in this process, that we, we could save lives. The last thing that we're doing now is and we've, and we've, as a part of that process, we've now uh, been, we're a founder of a program called the National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Programs. It's a hospital that would, a, a program I would encourage you to Google. We have now 32 programs across the country, including Can in Canada and London. And the goal of that program is to grow hospital-based violence, violence intervention programs. And our data shows that it does save lives, and on that network, when you Google it, it will show some of the papers that, sh that, that show that ability to save lives. So it's important that we use data to drive our processes. If we don't use data, hospital administrators, hospital providers are not gonna listen to us. And that has been one of the driving forces for what we've been doing. The second thing that, 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 we've, that we've done is we have after having our, our hospital-based violence programs, which saw all patients, what we realized was for domestic violence, it requires something a little different, because often these patients don't come to our RDs with severe injuries, but they are in our hospitals. They are part of our environment. So about eight years ago, we started a hospital-based domestic violence program. That, that is, that in our EDs, there were a set of questions that screens were, that were, that were asked to be, that were supposed to be, were, were to be asked by any woman who presented to our, to our ED. We were, for the first year, we got 100, 100 patients total. The next year, we had 400 and so on and so forth. So now we, we hope in the next few months to be able to publish that data to show, again, that a hospital-based domestic violence program will allow you to, guard, to see these patients that are, being, that are currently hidden in our system and will allow us to impact on them and hopefully save their life as well. So those are two things that we're doing right now, Lena, and I, and I think that, again, by, uh, through our network, hopefully we can show uh, that this is something that hospitals can do. Because hospitals are not interested in this issue, or they're interested in this issue, 
They don't have the tools or know how to show that they can do it. So what we're trying to show is that, yes, you can. It's what we're trying to do by, by our work. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. And now to Dr. Cunnins. What's on your wish list of what hospitals can do more to treat addiction and other public health issues? So thank you, Lena. And, and you know, I think in your lead up uh, to this panel, you named some of those really important actions hospitals can take. I think at a first big picture, we heard a bit about the importance of leadership this morning and how vital that is to changing practice, culture, and systems. And in this case, I think my wish list is we really need executive level leadership in healthcare systems to think about overdose prevention uh, and addiction treatment really across departments, across all parts of the, of the hospital system and into the community and in partnership with public health. So with executive level sponsorship and leadership, system level change can happen. That system level change needs to regard somebody coming in, for example, after an overdose as a time critical, time sensitive event, like a stroke, like thinking about getting thrombolytic medication into a person to save brain tissue. Same thing. The steps are clear, and we know what some of those high impact strategies are, offering medication treatment, for example, in a timely fashion. At the same time, addiction is a chronic illness. Think about HIV and think about the radical changes we were able to make both in inpatient and outpatient care around HIV AIDS. When I trained, we didn't have expertise and we didn't have care teams that included multiple health professionals, people with lived experience, people who could advocate for people with substance use or with uh, at risk for developing an addiction. So I think there are important lessons for HIV AIDS and other chronic illnesses where it's both a time sensitive condition and a chronic illness. And by thinking about it this way, I think the high impact strategies become clear. Changing prescription behaviors, for example, changing defaults in electronic health records. So people coming in for an acutely painful condition walk out with three days of uh, prescribed medicine rather than 30. Think about where the buprenorphine treatment is or is not available, and then at an executive level, ensuring that it is available in primary care, in specialty care, whether it's addiction or surgery or OB-GYN, wherever patients are. And then thirdly, think about the risk reduction strategies to help keep people safe, who at the moment are not ready or interested in changing their drug use, but yet can take important steps in improving their health through getting naloxone, through getting sterile syringes, through learning about the risks of fentanyl, which is the highly potent opioid that's increasing the risk of substance use right now. Thank you very much. And now to Dr. to Secretary Walker. Your state recently set a global target for health spending, along with a series of core health metrics. So how can the healthcare system do a better job in partnering so that we can really focus on social inequity? Thank you. We, we have been on a journey. And I liken this conversation around spending in healthcare to being on a long family car trip with the healthcare systems in our state. You start out, you're really excited. Everyone has their map and their pictures, and they're excited to get halfway. And then about halfway through, everyone in the back is ready to get out and stretch their legs, and maybe there's even a little crankiness and discomfort. That's sort of where we are, where um, <laughs> the healthcare systems weren't exactly pleased during that journey. But now we've gotten to a place where Governor Carney has issued an executive order and we're focused on data transparency, and, and we've launched this path of a new conversation. We're on that road trip, we're getting out of the car, and we're taking some pictures, and we're posting on Facebook. We're really excited to get started. And that means we're going to have a commitment where partners come to us around data transparency, 
for both healthcare spending and where we want to be on a growth trajectory, but also how we want to embed transparent measures around quality, how we have an open conversation as public health professionals and health systems around three critical issues in our state, around primary care utilization and preventable emergency department use, around opioid overdose deaths, which are rising in our state, and around cardiovascular disease and prevention. Those three areas will be places that we can come together. We can highlight areas of success where health systems are coming to the table and figuring out ways to innovate and create new solutions, but also bring new partners to the table. We need primary care at the table. It's not just about the health systems. We need reimbursement that aligns with these goals in quality and spending, and we are working together. So the exciting journey has just begun, but it really does require new partners coming together and the health systems playing a role in that, but also realizing not everyone is at the place of readiness for change and we have to be open to meet people where they are. So all of you talked about um, how it's not enough for people just to show up at the hospital, that we also have to envision doing things differently and, and really focusing on a system that improves public health. So what's one lesson that you can impart to all of us in our various roles as we, as we think about how, we, how hospitals can partner to do public health better? And I'll start with Dr. Cooper. Why, one of the things that uh, hospitals have to do is something that CMS is sort of is kind of pushing now. I mean, you may imagine I have a, CMS is not one of my favorite folks in part because they're always decreasing my reimbursement. <laughs> However, one of the things that they are trying to do is they're trying to push the idea of public health, of, po of population health in our communities. And I totally agree with, with that, with that concept. And I think that one of the things that healthcare systems can do is, be, is, is, is try to take care of the populations of, of communities they're, they are inv involved with. And, and I think by taking care of, 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 approaching this, of approaching, by approaching our communities from a population health perspective, we can then be able to increase the overall level of that community. Now, where, where I think the healthcare systems can play that role is that they can be leaders. Now, they, they certainly can, of course, provide the clinics that are in primary care clinics that are needed in those areas. But the other things that are needed in order to move those community forwards are to look at food deserts in those communities, to look at pest control in, in, the, in those communities, to look at uh, vacant housing in those communities, um, uh, looking at things like unemployment. Uh, how, how do you get the business community to do invest in uh, grocery stores that are large grocery stores, not those little small communities, stores that, are, that, are, that inadequately supply the kind of, of food choices that those communities need. So, and, and then how do you get, again, the other things that are needed in this are you know, the politicians to get the communities uh, in, involved as well, to get the other resources that are needed to drive those communities. So I think, and if you are able to approach those communities from a population health perspective, those are the kind of things that are going to impact violence. You know, better schools, the other part there. Those those communities that are that are where that are are where violence is taking place all lack the things I just outlined to you. We need a someone who, who can take the lead and bring all those other parts: pest control, vacant housing, food deserts, as a part of that. That's the role that I think that health care systems can do. They, 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 you, you would think maybe politicians could, but uh, I'm not so sure they may have the community, they have the right perspective to do it. Health care systems go into it without, have, they have that sort of moral authority, I think, to be able to drive that process. And that kind of, of approach to our communities to, to where violence takes place, not only will it impact the violence in those communities, and of course, again, police being a part of that, not only will it impact violence, it can impact other healthcare things as well. Asthma, yeah. um, uh, heart disease, diabetes, all those things are, that are problems that, that, that violent communities have also have 
diabetes, HIV, uh, asthma as well. So if we can, as, so, uh, so I think that, that healthcare systems can be a leader in driving a process that looks and Im that works on population health that impacts community, that impact communities. It's just a matter of, of saying, this is, I'm the hospital in this community. I'm going to take ownership of West Baltimore or East Baltimore. And I'm going to get all those other parts, again, pest control, et cetera, as a part of it. And we're going to do, we're going to do, a, do it for three years. Let's invest for three years in the process. And after that, that community is on their own. And let's go to then South Baltimore, et cetera, and see if we can then, by standing up those communities, began to impact the, the, the process that's in a diff, moving in a different direction. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. We only have not so much time left, but I want to hear from Dr. Khan and uh, Just Just to really plug us in public health is, I think, making connections between health systems and public health and local public health. Uh, we have skills and resources in public health and it's our job in public health to reach out to health systems, not just as regulators, but with data, with effective science, and ask health systems, how can we help you achieve your mission? I'll just say that healthcare systems play a huge role in creating the solutions that are necessary right now. They can demand more in terms of payment models, delivery system supports, so that we're reimbursing for value. And that conversation needs to happen over a period of time and can't happen with a light switch turn on, but we have to figure out how to come together and ask for that change and that transition together. And, and CMS is supportive of states taking the lead. Uh, healthcare systems and delivery systems should be out there putting their ideas forward. Please join me in thanking our panelists.